I've been seeing people use these cheap generic scalers since the beginnings of RetroRGB, and I'd always written it off since it's got some lag and it processes 240p signals incorrectly. Well, one developer named Rama has completely rewritten the software for it, and that changed everything about this device. Let's take a look and see what it could do. Before we begin, I think it's really important that everybody watching understands the context of this project. This is a hack that takes a mediocre scaler and makes it do some really impressive things. The fact that all the hardware needed can be bought for less than $40 from Amazon Prime, or much less if you're willing to risk eBay links, is what makes this scaler appealing to so many people. And as a note, some of those eBay links go directly to scams. A few people, including myself, have reported getting inexpensive 8200s only to have bags of bolts show up in its place. So definitely try to buy one of these from reputable resellers. Anyway, as awesome as this is, it's not a replacement for plug and play solutions like the RetroTink products and doesn't have the same precision control as the OSSC. Now, I'm certainly not trying to discourage anybody from using it. I just want to set realistic expectations but if you don't mind some tinkering, this is a device that does a whole bunch of really cool things that really make it worth the effort. So let's start out by showing the hardware setup and how to begin. The GBS control project requires three pieces of hardware. The GBS, ESP8266 Wi-Fi module, and a high quality five volt power supply. It's extremely important that you use the right PSU or you could destroy the equipment. I highly recommend using the ones linked below. Also, you'll see GBS8200 modules with both yellow buttons and black buttons. The ones with the yellow buttons signify a model that requires you to remove a component, otherwise you'll get interference. Models with the black buttons should be fine though. There's also a dual output version called the 8220 that will work with this mod and offer simultaneous dual output, but that one will also require a mod to improve the video quality. You'll need to replace R58 with a 100 or 120 ohm ferrite bead, and after the ferrite, add a 100 nanoferrite capacitor to ground. Regardless of the model, all will need the following installation methods performed. In order to prepare the GBS board for this custom firmware, you'll need to remove the three color potentiometers, as those levels will all be controlled digitally from now on. The easiest way to do this is with a desoldering gun, but there's other methods that can work too. I also removed some headers since I'll be wiring directly to these spots, but removing these isn't necessary and you could just solder to the bottom. Since I had the desoldering gun out anyway though, I figured I'd want to make it as clean of an install as possible. Next, you have to bridge the pins where the pots are to connect the video signals. I just used some pieces of resistors I had laying around to do all three. Make sure to connect to the spots exactly as you see here though, otherwise you won't get a signal at all. Then wire the corresponding points on the ESP8266 Wi-Fi module as listed on Rama's GitHub page. There's power, ground, and three signal pins. Alternatively, you could leave power and ground disconnected, but then you'll need two power supplies to run the device, so I prefer this method. I added a few layers of double-sided tape to mount the Wi-Fi module on a part of the GBS board with no components. I'm showing this easy install for do-it-yourselfers that are looking for the cheapest solution, but I'll show a better mounting option later. After that, I just cut the wires down to size and soldered them to the corresponding spots on the GBS scaler. The only tricky wire was connecting the debug pin, but I pre-tinned the wire and used flux, so I got it on pretty easily. Just remember that stuff like this is much easier with the right tools, and I don't mean expensive tools. The iron I use now is just about the same price as my old one, but much higher quality. Check out the tools page for more info. Lastly, just add a jumper to the two pins by the four buttons. If you forget this, it'll still work, it'll just have some issues. It won't hurt anything though, so it's not dangerous to not have it, but definitely remember to put it on. There's also an external clock generator you could install that gets rid of any screen tearing you might run into. You could buy the boards right from Amazon as well, and it involves soldering five more wires to it, like shown here. 
Experts with the right tools can probably do this install cleanly in around 30 minutes, but beginners are definitely looking at an hour or two. It's not that it's challenging, it's just good to take your time, go slowly, and double check every step. As a note, there's a kit being made that allows you to just plug in a GBS with no soldering necessary. Now, I still strongly suggest people remove the pots and add the output fix to the 8220, but it's not needed for this case to work. The image shown here is of a prototype, but the final kit will include a switch to toggle between VGA and HDMI outputs, so it would be safe to leave them both connected. Just keep in mind the 8200 only supports one output at a time, while the 8220 supports two. Okay, now that it's all connected, let's check out how to program the Wi-Fi module. In order to flash the GBS control software onto the Wi-Fi module, you'll need a few things. Start by downloading and installing the Arduino software required. There's different versions available, but I just used the basic Windows installer version. Once it's installed, you'll need to add some libraries and configure the connection. In the Arduino software, go to File, then Preferences, and copy and paste the URL from Rama's GitHub. Then go to Tools, Board, and Board Manager. Wait for it to load, and in the dialog box, search for ESP8266. Then install the one that you see here. Now go to Tools, Board, and choose your ESP8266 board. I had issues flashing mine with the generic modules, but the 2i flash worked fine with the one labeled Lolin Wemos D1, R2, and Mini. Then set the frequency to 160 megahertz, change the flash size to 4 megabyte FS 1 megabyte OTA 1019 kilobytes, and set the IWIP variant to V2 lower memory. Then connect the USB port on the Wi Fi module to your PC. After your computer has detected the module, select the detected COM port in the Arduino IDE. Next, download both libraries from the main GitHub location. I think you could just manually extract these, but I've always added them using the Arduino interface. I think both will work, but I'll show the way I do it here. There's also an optional library you can install that adds extra tools for the Wi-Fi module. You don't need it, but I installed it anyway, the same way I did the other two. Now that your Arduino IDE is configured, you can download the actual GBS control software. Just make sure to close out of any other Arduino windows before launching. Also, make sure wherever you extract and put the folder that it's labeled GBS-Control, not dash master at the end. Then open the main file and go to Sketch, then Verify Compile. That'll make sure everything is set correctly and safe to flash. It'll take a while depending on the speed of your computer, but definitely do this first. If you run into an issue here, go back and check all your other settings. I kept getting an error here, and that's how I learned to switch from the ESP8266 board to the Lowland Wemos board. Any errors you might run into will almost always be a result of a setting issue. Now that everything's confirmed, just hit the upload button. It'll take a few minutes and then end up at done uploading hard reset. And once the Wi-Fi module resets, it's been successfully flashed. To connect to the scaler, simply look for its Wi-Fi network on either your PC or phone, then connect with a default password of eight queues. Then access the device by opening a browser and going to GBS control or GBS control .local. I sometimes have issues connecting with my PC, but my laptop always connects just fine. If you have any issues, I suggest just trying a different device. From here, you can go into the settings and connect it to your local network if you'd like. Then you could access it from any device connected to your network. Here's a really cool feature. If GBS control can't find your network, it'll automatically default back to its own hotspot mode. That means if you decide to bring the scaler out of your network, or if you change your SSID, you don't need to reflash it or anything. If you do need to manually reset it, just connect the device to the Arduino software again and manually erase and reflash. Connecting your consoles is really easy if your source device outputs component video or VGA. Simply plug in whatever you need, but only one at a time. Connecting RGB SCART can be tricky though, as there's a few factors involved. 
You can use a passive adapter as you see here, but some consoles might not sync properly. If that's the case, you can add a 100 ohm resistor between the sync and ground pins. One trick is to wrap the resistor around like this and slide it right on, but keep in mind you'll need to remove this when using VGA. Alternatively, you could use a device like a SCART cleaner that adds a sync stripper and a low-pass filter. You won't need the resistor anymore, and you could even wire power directly to the board as well if you'd like. As a note, there's already a low-pass filter on the GBS, so you won't need to toggle that at all. Now, I realize all of that talk about adding the resistor, low-pass filters, and all that stuff might be a little bit confusing, but that's why I made that PSA at the beginning of this video, and that this is not just a plug-and-play solution like the Rad 2X that just works. This is a do-it-yourself kit that's always going to require some kind of nerding either on the input or output side. So, now let's take a look at some of the output solutions. GBS Control can output either VGA or component video through the D-sub ports. VGA outputs work exactly as expected, but component video output is a bit dim. This can be fixed by swapping R26 with a 110 ohm resistor, or even a 100 ohm should be fine. Alternatively, you could wire a switch to toggle between both if you'd like access to both signal outputs all at their highest qualities. Also, for component video, simply use an adapter that breaks out the RGB lines on the D-sub connector. Remember that you won't need a converter, just a pass-through cable like this one. As a note, dual output models can either both be VGA or both component video, depending on what you choose to output in GBS control, but you can't have one as component and one as VGA, at least not without external converters. Now, if you're going into a TV with component video inputs, or just a monitor with VGA inputs, there's really nothing extra to worry about. Just plug it in exactly as you would expect. However, always make sure to use good quality shielded cables, otherwise that alone could lower the video quality. If you need HDMI output, you have a few choices. VGA to HDMI adapters are cheap, plug directly into the GBS, and usually work great. You might run into an issue with TVs confusing the VGA signal with the PC resolution, but it's such a compact solution that I think it's worth trying, and I didn't have any issues at all with 1080p output. If you'd like, you could use a component video to HDMI converter instead, but then you'd want to mod your GBS like I mentioned before, and it is a bulkier solution. Either way, just make sure to use converters that are only analog to digital converters, otherwise it'll add lag. Just ADCs are fine, but avoid any one that talks about scaling. I have links to one I use in the description. As a note, the output of the GBS has a low-pass filter built in. I also tried using an external one just to see if it made a difference, but it wasn't necessary at all. Now, before I even load a game through this, let's test some lag. In its original form, before the mod, the GBS adds variable latency of 1-2 to two frames of lag. Also, it processes all 15 kHz signals as 480i, which means 240p signals will be flickery and won't look right. While it definitely had some uses in its original form, it's not something I would recommend to most people. But with GBS control installed, it's a completely different story. 240p is processed correctly and sits at a non-varying 4 milliseconds of lag. That's an amazing accomplishment. Then, 480i shows just under a frame of lag in both deinterlacing modes. Now, you can get zero lag Bob deinterlacing using the OSSC or RetroTINK products, however, the GPS Control's motion adaptive deinterlacing is very high quality, making this lag totally acceptable. In fact, it's less than half the lag of the FrameMeister's deinterlacing. As a note, this GBS has the clock generator installed. Without it, using the time sleuth, you'd get a variable reading like I did in previous videos. However, it's still the same sub one frame of lag, regardless of whether the clock generator is installed or not. Lastly, the GBS custom firmware can downscale an image, and downscaling 480p to 240p results in only half a frame of lag. As far as I know, that makes this the fastest downscaler available. More on this later, though. Now, let's finally take a look at performance. As a 240p scaler, it works fine. 
It's not going to be as sharp as something like an open source scan converter, but if you're on a budget and can perform these mods yourself, it's an excellent choice. In my opinion, if you're buying a pre-installed kit, I wouldn't buy this just for 240p, but if you need any of its other features as well, you'll be happy with the 240p scaling. Its other features are where I think GBS Control is most impressive though. Let's check them out. Here's native 480p scaled to 1080p. I actually suggest trying both the 960p and 1080p modes to see which looks better on your TV. But either way, this is an impressive feature for such a cheap device that barely adds lag. Depending on your TV's built-in scaler, this might be a major upgrade, or at the very least, equal to what your TV could do. Now here's the same game run in native 480i using the GBS Control's Bob deinterlacing. The same type of deinterlacing you'd see on the RetroTINK products and the OSSC. It looks pretty good and holds its own against the other choices. But now check it out with its motion adaptive deinterlacing turned on. This is an impressive feature that really stands out. Now, it's almost impossible for a 480i game to look as good as a native 480p source, but since most PS2 games don't have any 480p options, some kind of deinterlacing is always required. I think as a scaler, this holds up really well against some of the best options, especially when you consider the cost. I'm currently working on a video dedicated just to deinterlacing, and we'll cover this topic in a lot more detail in that one. I just wanted to show some examples here. Another really awesome feature of the GBS control is how fast it switches between 240p and 480i. This is an issue with games that have 240p gameplay, but 480i menus. However, with GBS control, I couldn't see any delay at all. I even switched from a PS2 outputting component video to a PS1 outputting RGB just to test two different scenarios, and there wasn't any delay in either. I believe the reason it's able to do this is the one field buffer, or four milliseconds of lag we showed earlier. It's able to buffer just enough of the signal to prevent dropouts, but not enough to add any noticeable lag. The RetroTINK is the next fastest device, but there's still a tiny bit of dropout, making the GBS control a really good choice for people who stream those games. There's still a few more things I'd like to demonstrate. Here I have my PlayStation 3 outputting component video into GBS Control, which is converting it to RGB HV. I lag tested these modes as well, and it looks like RGB to component or component to RGB HV is also zero lag. Now it gets a little more impressive. Let's test downscaling. I'll connect with my phone, a little blurry here, and set the GBS to downscale to 240p. At the moment, this beta feature does a decent job converting 480i to 240p, but once we set the PlayStation 3 to 480p mode, now we can see really crisp 240p downscaling. As I showed before, this only has about half a frame of lag, making this the cheapest and possibly fastest downscaler available. I'm currently working on a whole other video dedicated to downscaling that'll compare GBS control to other solutions out there. I'll also go into detail about why someone would ever want to lower the resolution of video rather than upscale it like we normally do, so please keep your eyes open for that video. Before I go, I'd like to remind everyone that the GBS Control Project is open source, and I really hope more people will help contribute to tweak these features even more. Also, if you use this project, please consider sending some support to Rama, the developer, through the link I posted below. And speaking of support, if you liked this video, please consider supporting me on Floatplane or Patreon, because without your help, this research, the website, and weekly podcast wouldn't be possible. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.